Okay, welcome to the I Am The Cavalry track. I'm Josh Corman. Uh, first off, because B-Sides was the birthplace of I Am The Cavalry, I always like to say happy birthday, Cavalry 11 years ago this year. So give yourself a round of applause. <laughs> the basic conceit back then, uh, if I get the slides working, you'll see we've improved it a little bit. Uh, what I said with Nick Prococo upstairs um, 11 years ago, August 1st, was that um, we, our dependence on connected technology was growing faster than our ability to secure it in areas affecting public safety, economic, and national security. One more time. I have another dongle too. If your dongle's bad. <laughs> okay. Sure. Okay. Um, that was true 11 years ago. We wanted to focus on where bits and bytes meet flesh and blood. We wanted to focus on public safety, human life. Initially, you might recall, we did the uh, five-star automotive cyber safety framework on our first birthday to look at how cars could be safer. We wanted to pivot from an easy thing like cars with only 20 car makers to a much more uh, challenging space of medical devices because there's 10,000 medical device makers of all sorts of, of flavors. And it was an audacious goal that if we use empathy and teamwork and complementary skills, if we were a helping hand instead of a pointing finger, if we uh, try to be part of the solution and meet people where they are, identify by an risk, use their love language, that maybe we'd have greater results. Now over time, as we were embraced, what we, we sort of morphed into is that through our over-dependence on undependable technologies, we have created the conditions such that any accident or adversary can have a profound impact on public safety, economic, and national security. So quiet yourself for today. We're gonna kinda outline what today's gonna look like and set the tone, but really ask yourself whether you look at things like change healthcare, which is a single common dependency across most of US healthcare, something north of 75% of hospitals had cash flow disruption for months. Most of the country's hospitals have four to six weeks of their burn rate on hand. That's about it, that's their cash reserves. And they were down for months. So short of emergency relief, um, we had severe financial strains on already strained US healthcare, where you and your family need timely access to patient care when and where you need it. So one hack, everyone counted the dollar amount of the ransoms or the number of breached records. What you should have been paying attention to is degraded delayed care uh, when we look at national critical functions across healthcare, everyone focuses on HIPAA, the, the confidentiality of your PHI, the, and, and they forget that there's three others we're responsible for, which is uh, maintain access to medical records, which is how we know your chemotherapy cocktail, if you need it to stay alive and stay with your loved ones. Uh, it's also how you can get approved for surgeries and other things like that. More importantly than just the access to medical records is provide medical care, timely access to care when and where you need it. And as the protracted nature of financial disruption occurs and the workflow is broken and billing and insurance for payment is broken, this further financially stresses hospitals to the point of closure as we described last year, where we saw St. Margaret's in Illinois close its doors forever. And it's not the first one to close its doors. It was one of over 200 rural hospitals to permanently close on the US footprint. But this was the first one to publicly admit that their ransom event had a contributing cause to their financial uh, outcome. So when we look at these things where we're not just looking at the confidentiality of the data, but the ability to have access to your medical records, to provide medical care in a timely manner, or to have a hospital close enough to you to get timely access to patient care, you know, these are growing consequences. And that's a hack. Well, what about the CrowdStrike event we recently incurred? Malicious intent is not a prerequisite to harm. That's part of our canonical from Bo, uh, reminding us that it's accidents and adversaries. So when we are over-dependent on those undependable things, we expose ourselves to these disruptions. So I want you to like soul search um, and tell me if you hear any lies de detected across these critical infrastructure sectors, lifeline critical infrastructure sectors, we are seeing more disruptions, larger disruptions, longer disruptions, and more life safety affecting disruptions. 
And the people in our communities don't call these hacks or glitches. They just feel disrupted. It disrupts patient care, it disrupts cash flow, it disrupt, disrupts workflow, it disrupts flights to your own wedding. And I feel increasingly like we are failing the public. So it's not 100% your responsibility. We have a government, we have private industry, we have the talent pool in this room and at DEF CON later this week. But I believe we have allowed the public to trust things that are untrustworthy. We made them feel like it was safe enough to connect water and wastewater facilities to the naked internet. And through this over-dependence on undependable things, we're in the state we're in. And the reason we want you to really be present and simmer and allow yourself to be comfortable in your discomfort for today and tomorrow, and we're gonna outline what that looks like, is that it's about to get worse. So you don't have to believe in this as a certainty, but we saw in January a few things. Uh, one is the top four cyber leadership figures for the US testified in unclassified briefings to Congress about their um, detection and eviction of a campaign they refer to as Volt Typhoon. Has anyone in here not heard of Volt Typhoon? You're gonna hear a lot about it today and tomorrow. Okay. So the very tiny thumbnail to not take oxygen away from some of the other uh, presenters is that uh, China's national public state of policy is they have intentions towards Taiwan as early as 2027. And part of the Volt Typhoon campaign that was shared with Congress in hearings you can watch and probably should watch, I rewatched them again yesterday, is you had the FBI director, Christopher Wray, uh, CISA director Jen Easterly, uh, recently uh, retired General Nakasone from NSA, and the Office of the National Cyber Director in the White House, Harry Coker, all telling Congress that they have found a campaign called Volt Typhoon in critical infrastructure, present malware that they had to evict, uh, leg and wait, not to ransom, not to shut it off for a day or two, not to um, use as a botnet, but as what they're calling pre-positioning. It's in place as either a deterrence or on an escalatory ladder such that they could rain chaos and destruction on this infrastructure uh, to keep the US either distracted or out of the fight. Now, how many of you took a flight to get here? Okay, to take a little pressure off, how many of you heard the mandatory speech in the unlikely event of a water landing, what you, know, what you should do, okay? So maybe this is a very low probability event, and maybe it's not 2027. Some people think we use economic sanctions or maybe diplomacy, or maybe depends on who's in the White House on how we're gonna treat something like this. Or maybe if you ask Dmitry Alperovitch, I think he's saying 28, 29. So maybe you have a couple more years. But I think the thing that you should simmer with today as an exercise, think of this as a tabletop crisis simulation for the next two days. In the unlikely event of a conflict it will be a hybrid conflict. And this isn't a theoretical scenario. We have found the presence and intent and state of policy. And whether it's China in 2027 as part of a hybrid conflict or sooner with Russia, we have conflicts underway in Ukraine. We have conflicts underway in the Middle East and Gaza and had some uh, the recently flare ups with assassinations in Tehran. So any one of these times we see a conflict, it could be a hybrid conflict. And what this room knows is that we are prone, we've been prey, and we've really been lucky that we haven't had sufficient predator appetites and interests. So since we know that we have had hacks of the water we drink as early as the pandemic, the food we put on our table with things like JBS, Dole, or the talks you're going to hear later today, the oil and gas pipelines and municipalities that do last mile for power for the US or timely access to patient care in record levels. Hundreds of attacks per year and even when they don't hit the hospitals, they can hit change health care. We have seen proof of harm in the water we drink, the food we put on our table, the power for our communities and even the health care we depend upon. So at RSA this year, I did a talk in a workshop called Getting Serious as a double entendre that things are both getting serious and it's high time that we did. 
yes, the government's doing some things. Yes, they're doing some good things. Many of the things they're doing are going to take years to manifest. So I pose to you, if we are two and a half years, a little under two and a half years from a 2027 calendar, what is the art of the possible that we could do to make sure that we're as resilient and ready as possible? What can we do left of boom? What can we do right of boom? And if you want to sit through this as a citizen whose family could be affected directly, think about what do I do for my household? And if you have a little bit more empathy and heroism in you, what can you do for your town or your county? And perhaps if you're feeling really heroic, maybe what can you do for your state? But we've tried the top-down federal push, and there's a lot of things happening there, and they will eventually bear fruit. But we have excluded that last mile. We've excluded the, the owners and operators in your communities, the municipal leadership, and our neighbors. And they increasingly bear the brunt when we fail. Want to try? Yep. Okay. okay, so let's do an exercise while he's doing this, because you don't need to see for this. Close your eyes for a moment. I want you to picture the hospital that you take your family to. What's it called? How far away from it, your house is, is it? I want you to remember the last time you were there. Was it to see the birth of a child? To take a wounded family member? to say goodbye to a friend. How far away is that hospital? Okay, now I want you to picture that it's unavailable to you. Where would you go instead? Is it across town? Is it in the town next to you? You know the name? Which one's closer? Now what if that's also owned by the same company that's ransomed? Okay, open your eyes please. Last year I showed a map of the US. And then when I did a congressional task force for healthcare industry cybersecurity in 2016 and 2017, we referred to the nation's 7,000 hospitals. If you look at all the new materials from the government, we refer to the nation's 6,000 hospitals. What happened to the other thousand? Now this isn't cyber, but US hospitals and privatized medicine for a whole bunch of hazards, financial restraint constraints, nursing shortages, a pandemic, Lots of different reasons, private equity firm takeovers, normal mergers and acquisitions. We went from 7,000 to 6,000. I showed a map last year that was animated with over 200 rural closures. They're not just bought by somebody else. Some of them are gone forever. And we know time is brain. We know for heart, you have 4.4 minutes to see an, a, a measurable, quantifiable difference in mortality rates for heart conditions. We know for strokes, it's one, three, four hours. Time is brain, save life, save brains, hawk again, walk again. Christian will go through that later. So if you don't have a hospital within a couple hours driving distance of where you live, you're increasingly likely to perish or suffer if you don't have a hospital. So out of those 200, we've been pushing pretty hard for the last year. As we were packing for Vegas this year, a report came out through Becker's, there are another 728 U.S. hospitals at critical risk of immediate closure or at risk of closure. So the bottom two, you know, the most intense two risk categories, again, not due to cyber, but it's based on their cash on hand reserves. So if they have four to six weeks cash on hand and a ransom could knock you out for 12 plus, that's a death sentence. They will not get back up from that punch. They will either be put out of business in your communities or weaken sufficiently to be part of an acquisition, strip mine with worsened outcome, worsened care, and worsened capacity. So I am not holding us accountable for weakened, stressed US healthcare footprint. I am pointing out that we've had hundreds of ransoms per year, and none of those hospitals should close on our watch because of what we're doing or what we're failing to do. So back to that point of being over dependent on dependable things, I think it's time we try something new. Uh, there's a couple things I'm gonna share. So today, let me start with today and tomorrow's track without visuals. Um, number one, <clears throat> uh, we wanted to open today to ask you to sit through a very well chosen set of talks. They're gonna focus not on everything critical, not on everywhere where bits and bites meet flesh and blood, but on four key areas. 
you're going to see a talk from Sick Codes and Friends. He's actually here this year. His flights made it. Um, no substitute for Casey John Ellis on Hungry Hungry Hackers, where we're going to look at some of the strategic concentration of risk and cold chain and food chain where disruptions can have a more profound impact. So I want you to think about the food you eat. Hackers like to eat. Um, we're also going to have a talk on, uh, from Dr. Christian Demeff, one of the co-founders of CyberMedSummit.org, and he's going to talk about healthcare and intensive care. We were talking, we told Congress in 2017, healthcare industry cybersecurity was in critical condition. The sector leadership intends that by 2029 to go from critical condition to stable condition, and we said, guys, it's actually going the other way. It's getting much more dangerous. So uh, we're going to hear from Christian about hospitals. Now, these things are interdependent. So what we came to learn through some of this disaster planning for things like Volt Typhoon is what happens when the water goes out. So at this year's Cyber Med Summit in DC, we had an emergency physician and disaster scientists walk Socratically the audience through. Is it working? OK. We're, we were walking the, the, uh, walking the audience through when the water goes off, what breaks in the hospital, and how quickly. And let me just tell you, you'll hear a little bit more from Christian, but no water means no hospital, real fast. You can go without power for a while. You can go without food for a while. No water means no surgery, no flushing of toilets, no sanitation, no scrubbing in, no cooking of meals, no hydrating of patients. And that's just what's in the hospital. Ooh. OK. So I'm going to call an audible given how little time is left. And let me get through two more of these for today. So, so you're going to have uh, hungry, hungry hackers. You're going to have healthcare as an intensive care. Dean from the water sector is back, and he's going to help us understand: is it an inconvenience? <laughs> how inconvenient and/or catastrophic is it if we lose water? And most of your communities have one and only one water and wastewater facility. So Dean's going to give us the perspective from the water industry itself, and he's increasingly been part of this hacker community. And then Emma is going to talk about um, living with the enemy, how much certified pre-owned infrastructure we have in municipal power. So this could be electricity, oil and gas, heat, you name it. So today is really going to simmer in what has happened in the last 12 months since we were last here on water, food, power, and urgent care, and emergency care. But also, I've, I've, ta I've asked each of them to say, how bad could it get if you saw destructive malware, not inconvenience malware, but destructive malware hit any one of these? And also, which ones upstream and downstream you depend upon? And if today kind of paints the edges of what are the elevated consequences we're facing, then tomorrow has three two-hour blocks of uncomfortable conversations where we're going to look through what can we do to protect our families, our communities, both left a boom and right a boom, so that we make sure that in the face of escalating disruption, we start ratcheting down how disruptible we are. So I have a few closing remarks to do in a second, but do you want to do your uh, garden thing or? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, All right. This at times you may feel like this is doomsday prep. Remember, in the unlikely event of a water landing. We hope this never happens, but there's no technical barriers to us having destructive disruption of some of these four basics. So maybe instead. So we're not talking about doomsday preparation, but just to, we want to talk about life. We want to talk about gardens. More on this is coming tomorrow. But think of a garden. Think of a victory garden. For those of you who, are, who do not have real estate upon which you can garden, and next slide, think of a community garden. We're gonna, we're gonna try to engage with you to talk about the concept of community and what it means to work with each other toward a common goal. And next slide. And when we think about gardens, we should 100% think about water. So um, more on this to come. There are actual 
tangible things that we can do today, more coming on this, to prepare for certain unpleasant situations. So it's not panic. It's not merely pick up a hobby of gardening. Things are getting pretty serious. I talked about Maslow's hierarchy needs a lot. There's a lot of things that we could protect and do protect, but we tend to protect the things that we can live without. And we have mess with water, with food, with oil and gas for the Eastern seaboard, with the, uh, the, the, the municipals that run our towns and cities, the schools your children attend, higher ed, federal agencies charged with national security, timely access to patient care with now proven moral consequences. We know it's starting to affect patient's care, patient human life. Initially, the Sysicova Task Force that Bo and I served on published the first statistical proof of loss of life using data science during the pandemic from excess deaths associated with ICU strain. This inspired other publications that Christian Demeff's gonna walk you through where they saw the blast radius of an attack on UCS, excuse me, on uh, Scripps Institute in San Diego, had worsened outcomes in the hospitals who took their overflow. So the blast radius increased wait times, worsened outcomes, and then later he studied heart uh, and other conditions that are time sensitive to show that during a ransomware, the death toll goes up. So he will explain that with the right language that I'm blowing. And then we saw even if we can get the hospitals right or the communities who take the overflow right, that the financial constraint is not being down for a, a six to 12 week period, it's being down forever. This is the map I referred to where you're starting to see every single one of those dots is a permanently closed facility. And uh, we learned in DC from the head of the healthcare and sector, the healthcare and public health sector coordinating council, Mark, Dr. Mark Jarrett, that when a hospital leaves a region, there's a corresponding 10 to 15% drop of economic stability for that region. So what starts as a care desert becomes a desert desert as it can't sustain protection for the people who live there. And if the people who live there are in a major hub for food production or manufacturing for our increasingly consolidated supply chains, depending on where this is in the map, this can be a worsened outcome. Then we learned that even if you do everything right, and even if you have the financial security to make sure you're not one of those dots, that a common systemically important critical infrastructure entity like change can knock everybody down. It's a class break. So systemically important critical infrastructure has been a long standing policy the Cyberspace Slayer Commission has been pushing, and nobody in the government, nobody in the private sector wanted to do it. They kept putting off their homework and hitting the snooze button. And what I pointed out to CNN is if we don't proactively identify our systemically important entities, and I'm hoping each of the four speakers today do so, help hint to us what these systemically important entities are, these weak links in the supply chain, maybe a dozen or so, that if they go down, everybody goes down. If we don't find them proactively, our adversaries will continue to reveal them to us while we burn. So I hope we don't have war tomorrow. Uh, we're gonna have some talks from me and um, White House ONCD midday, followed by uh, Bo Woods and Carl to talk about wartime footings and wars, rumors of wars. Maybe we won't have one. Maybe we'll have some Volt Typhoon activity in 2027 or beyond, this elevated threat context. But maybe we have more time. The tri but one thing that is a deterrent for them trying is if we can get our act together on resilience. It's not just China, though, where we have conflicts in Ukraine, conflicts around Israel, Gaza. So we have Iran to contend with, Russia to contend with, North Korea's got a decent capability. And if you haven't read Ghost Fleet, now's the time to do so. I think August Cole made his book free for download. Now, you can have a global superpower that's really well fortified that you'd be an idiot to invade the city, but you can also take it out with its aqueducts. So I am going to ask that people pay keen attention to water over the next two days. And we don't have a ton of time. The government's doing a lot of the right things, but it's gonna take 10 years for some of those policies to matriculate. This room helped cause and pass into law the Patch Act last year. So we have mandatory minimum cybersecurity hygiene for all medical devices as of last spring. They have to be patchable. They have to have coordinated disclosure programs to work with helpful hackers. They have to have S-bombs. They have to have threat models. We have done a great job. And it takes 15 years plus to rotate out all the bad stuff slowly over time. So we're doing good things, but we don't have infinite time. So think like Apollo 13. They only had a little bit of time to save those uh, astronauts and what was on board. It's not science fiction movies with Tom Hanks. It's a real thing that really happened. Remember Y2K, that was my first job. A lot of people think it was a nothing burger. A lot of us know firsthand it was a nothing burger in part because we said, here's how long we have. 
here's the stuff that's too important to fail. How do we put our cobalt programmers on those things and our testers on those things? Many of these owners and operators are what we referred to in the past as target rich cyber poor. They can't just do best practices. They can't just buy some products. They can't just take free products from Google or Microsoft, although that might be part of the solution. So think about getting your stuff off Shodan. Think about avoiding the bad practices like end of life unsupported operating systems naked on the internet. Think about maybe the CISA cyber performance goals. At the talk at RSA, which I hope that you watch, David and I talked about certain um, things to that go away and smash and break. So to channel Kaminsky, who is formative to the cavalry in the first place, and one of his best lines was, of all the things hackers break and smash, perhaps the most important is assumptions. Maybe at your leisure, talk about how if your business or your community thinks that they're insured, they're not, or that their BCDRS covers this downtime, it doesn't, or that your backups make you more resilient, make them watch the video from Idaho National Labs blowing up the diesel generator. And if you think our supply chain's resilient on paper, trust me, during the pandemic, it wasn't resilient in real life. So you can watch that at a slower pace as a pivot towards the next speaker here. So let me pivot to this. Today is gonna be looking at the last 12 months of increasing disruptions and asking the question, if we saw destructive malware like has been found and evicted already from things like Volt Typhoon, what would happen? And tomorrow is gonna be getting really uncomfortable about what we can do about it as citizens, for our families, for our communities on that hierarchy because the government's doing stuff it's just not going to manifest fast enough and if you haven't noticed we're about to have a bunch of elections and change the political leadership and we're going to lose some momentum in the last two and a half years we have to prepare so on the food you're going to hear from casey on the water you're going to hear from dean on the municipal power you're going to hear from emma on the hospitals that you need for life and death you're going to hear from christian we have some other great talks today but that footprint is not heading in the right direction could get worse from financial constraint and once again for real this time if it's not us, who is it? And we can't do it alone. So it's gonna take some urgency and courage. And once again, you are the calorie. I have an announcement to make. I hope I can do this quickly without cutting into our next speaker too much. <clears throat> All right, let me do the announcement here. So um, last year I posed, we've been doing this for a decade. It's been amazing. We've had more results than we thought we could. But what should we do for the next decade? Should we end it, transform it? combine it with other initiatives, and that's been a difficult thing to answer, especially because some of these larger disruptions. So I have to announce today at least one opportunity for this. We're not committing the cavalry to this without your consent, but we are hoping this strikes a chord with you. Um, today, we have announced, um, I have taken the lead of a one-year pilot. Craig Newmark from Craigslist, a philanthropic donor here, has been taken by the urgency and the impact on civilians from the, some of the materials that we've been working on, especially in the context of a 2027 situation. So I'm gonna try to do this from memory. Um, the why is we are over dependent on undependable things, increasingly manifesting harm for average citizens. We're increasingly failing them, these accidents and adversaries and that's mostly been accidents and financial adversaries. So heading into 2027, it could get worse. So the what, we're gonna focus on the nexus of water, food, emergency care, and local power. The when, uh, working backwards from a ticking clock of 2027, maybe we have extra, maybe we have less. The answer becomes what is the art of the possible to identify and buy down risk? Maybe it's not shields up. Maybe it's connections down for these water facilities. Maybe it's not just do zero trust. Maybe it's that we work with them on tabletop crisis simulations and we find their love languages. So the how, I'm gonna take a page out of disaster science. When a hurricane's coming, you don't wonder what the public can and can't digest. There's three eyes that we're gonna to bring to bear here with a creative arts budget. Number one is inform, number two is in influence, and number three is inspire. The more consequential a thing, the more forthright we must be. You never exaggerate, and this is gonna be hard for this room, you never discount or downplay. You tell them what you know, you tell them what you don't know in a way that they can understand. Number two, you influence their behavior. The ideal thing we think you could do to remove harm is X, Y, Z. Failing that, here's some other best alternatives. And then the inspire is you stay in contact, 
you encourage that if we stay updated and we innovate and we share lessons learned, we're going to be okay. So we're going to try to take a page out of these unnatural of natural disasters to help us with some of these unnatural disasters. And then lastly, um, it's not going to be technical manuals. We're going to meet them where they are, find their love language, translate, and make this accessible using, for the first time, a creative arts budget. So these could be explainers. These could be videos, these could be podcasts, these could be memes and World War II style pop propaganda. This could be bar rescue, kitchen confidential type methods to do whatever works with A-B testing intensely for one year where the pilot's gonna be focused initially on the nexus between water and hospitals because no water, no hospital. So you are not required to participate, but the working title, as we work with the creative arts agencies and find our ultimate language is undisruptible 27. So what is our North Star? Of course, we're not gonna protect every water facility and every community from every single attacker by 2027. But when you say, how do I reduce a little risk? You do certain things. But if you ask, how could I make this community undisruptible? You might actually ask important things. So keep in mind that the cavalry will continue on its own, ideally with a focus on how to best protect you, your family, your community. But we may also be able to create demand for some of these central federal resources in parallel. So with that, um, there is also um, a Wired article this morning from Lily Hay Newman that I'm dying to read. <laughs> and uh, I wanna make sure that uh, please suffer a, a small amount of discomfort a day or two and see where your it takes you and your brain and ask what you're willing and able to do. Maybe, you know, we can try some things this year and really scale some things next year. And when we were running the pandemic stuff, we didn't have three years to harden these vaccine supply chain targets or rubble, rubber glove targets or hospitals. We had about three months. And when you start to ask yourself, what can I do in three months? The answer is non-zero and sometimes it's really good. So necessity is the mother of invention. We have some of that now. I respect and admire each of you. Look at all we've accomplished for the first 11 years. Let's really be present with our discomfort for the next two days. I look forward to it.